भाषा घुगुती रूजो ए निभाषा घुगुती रूजो मेरी ए जो सुनाली रूजो ए Ghuguti Runjo Welcome to the Missouri Mountain Festival 2020. I'm Jamie Alter. And I'm Meha Bhardwaj. Together we will be hosting this festival. Today we're here at our virtual venue, Woodstock School's Hannaful Center for Outdoor Education and Environmental Study. Located in the first range of the Himalaya at 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet above sea level, Masuri is a hill station in northern India. Woodstock School is the oldest international boarding school in Asia, founded in 1854. The Missouri Mountain Festival began 15 years ago in 2005 and has brought more than 200 eminent mountaineers, writers, artists, photographers and musicians to the Woodstock campus. This year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are holding a virtual online festival with more than 50 speakers from all over the world celebrating the diversity of the Himalaya. Special thanks to our festival sponsors, the Friends of Woodstock School Foundation and the Paul and Suzanne Hannaful Foundation. At this time, we'd like to introduce the team that put together the festival. Krishnan Kutti, Executive Director of the Hannaful Center. Akshay Shah, Head of Programs at Hannaful Center. Renu Oberoi, Assistant Director of the Missouri Mountain Festival. Stephen Alter, Founding Director of the Missouri Mountain Festival. Before we begin our opening session, we'll have a brief word of welcome from Dr. Craig Cook, Principal of Woodstock School. Good day to everybody. I'm Craig Cook, the Principal at Woodstock School, and it's an honor and privilege to have your participation with us in the Missouri Mountain Festival on behalf of Woodstock School, on behalf of the Hannibal Center. At Woodstock, we have a long legacy of inviting folks into our space here in the beautiful hillsides of Missouri. And we want to continue that legacy as we begin the 2020 Missouri Mountain Festival. We look forward to your participation and hearing from the different speakers. And we just welcome you to this great event. Thank you. Okay, let's get this show on the road. We're ready to begin the first session of the Missouri Mountain Festival 2020. And we have an exciting lineup of speakers. Our first session is a performance by the Tetsuo sisters from Nagaland. Hey, oh, hey. I'm Mercy. Hi, I'm Lulu. Hi, I'm Azi. Hi, I'm Kuvele. And we are Tetsuo, Tetsuo sisters. sisters from Nagaland. We are so delighted to be a part of the Musuri Mountain Festival 2020. And we have a song for you. Our song talks about how if you have a song in your heart, you will never be alone and loneliness will never be your friend. This one's called Tokweli. Good. 
And now our next presentation is a collaboration between the Missouri Mountain Festival and the Himalayan Club's Oral History Archives. Harish Kapadia, uh, one of India's great contemporary explorers, interviews some of the great British climbers of the 70s and 80s. Today we have Chris Bonington. Sir, Sir Chris Bonington, without hesitation, I would say, is a living legend. And there are many facets of his life and climbing, uh, which are very difficult to cover in a short time. But in short, his prime contribution to me, according to me, is uh, bringing out a new philosophy of climbing a mountain the hard way up. Annapurna, Everest, both may have easier routes, but to challenge it by south face and south face face was his, uh, his credit. Secondly, he organized uh, many expeditions where very leading, famous, and ambitious mountaineers from England and others were involved. And it is his great diplomacy, open-heartedness, by which he gelled them all together in one unit and used their ambitions and completely abilities towards the mountain. And they climbed. He lost many climbing friends where also he was genuinely uh, felt sorry and explained to the families. His writing is unparalleled. He has written a number of books, produced a number of movies, and uh, his books are also very warmly and nicely written, which one should say. And despite all this uh, high-end activities and everything, uh, Chris has remained very, very humble and warm. I met him in 1983, and since we have been uh, good friends ever since. And I can vouch that he has not changed at all. He's still the childlike smile, happiness to climb something. And this high life, he can absolutely fit in very well. But at the same time, he retains his charms to remain with friends. If a sponsor offers him a five-star hotel room, he will not go there but he'll be staying at friend's house. And uh, that's what we all notice. So this is uh, a great person whom I am very happy to call my friends, philosopher and guide. And at age of 86 today, Sir Chris is still walking around and almost has undiminished enthusiasm for uh, talking and lecturing. I'm sure people like him are rare to come by and he is a generation in itself. Thank you. Well, I actually started climbing in 1951, and uh, I was a, a young lad, 16 years of age, at school in London. And I had actually been my grandfather. Uh, who was German and had worked for the British throughout his life uh, in the Andaman Islands, in fact, and had ended up as a harbour master in the Andaman Islands. And um, he had retired to Ireland, and the first climb I ever did, or walk I ever did, was a little hill just outside Dublin. And then I saw on the way back uh, home to London, and you got the ferry across to Dublin, from Dunleary to Holyhead, and then a train to London. And he went around Snowdonia, and I saw these big hills uh, to the south, and I thought it would be wonderful to go and climb on them. And I persuaded a young friend of mine, Anton Felton, uh, to hitchhike with me up to Snowdonia in the winter of 1951 uh, to try to climb Snowdon. And it was a very hard winter. It was covered in snow. and that first view I had of Snowdon, which is from a little village called Capelcurig, about 10 miles from Snowdon. And to me, Snowdon was Mount Everest. It was as distant, and as exciting, and yet attainable to a youngster. And, and we failed to get up it. We were actually avalanched off it, and perhaps that might have been the end of the story there and then. And um, the South, it was, uh, the 1970 was a uh, 
a kind of a key year in the development of uh, Himalayan climbing. You could argue that before 1970, on the whole, the, the routes that were being climbed in the Himalayas were comparatively straightforward, climbing mountains by the easiest possible way. Uh, 1970 was when, in fact, climbers from different countries around the world, the climbing countries around the world, thought, well, no, we can actually, we want to climb routes that would be difficult in the Alps. And so using alpine techniques, the kind of techniques you need to climb the north wall of the Eiger, the southwest pillar of the Dru, and take them to the Himalayas. And so in 1970, when the Himalayas opened up again, that year, there was um, the German expedition led by um, Hurlikofer to the Rupel face of Nanga Parbat. There was a French expedition uh, climbing the west ridge of Manaslu, a hugely challenging route. There was the Japanese making the first attempt on the southwest face of Everest, arguably the, the hardest way up the highest mountain on earth. And we chose the south face of Annapurna from a photograph that I'd been given by a man called Jimmy Roberts, who was my, the leader of my expedition in 1960 to Annapurna to his ex-army and in fact was the founder of trekking in the Himalayas when he started mountain travel. So we were going, we were actually going with this huge kind of face just on the basis of one photograph uh, and, uh, and then putting the expedition together and we and then I had all the challenges of getting the money, sponsorship, getting all the equipment, coordinating people. And we had on that expedition the best climbers at the time in Britain, uh, people like Dougal Haston, who was just emerging. He hadn't been to the Himalayas, but he was a brilliant alpinist and uh, was a charismatic figure. Don Willems was my deputy leader. Um, we'd done so many hard climbs together in the past and an absolutely brilliant mountaineer. Um, Nick Escort, Martin Boyson and so on. So we had a very, very strong team. Uh, and here we were using uh, new techniques. We were using seed style techniques. You couldn't imagine climbing the south face of Annapurna alpine style. Um, so we were using fixed ropes, we were using tents, but we were a small team. We only had six high altitude Sherpas because quite rightly we, we realized that the Sherpas who had never done this kind of climbing before, you couldn't expect them to, to, to work on very steep fixed ropes. Um, and somehow we managed to get up it and, and climb the south face. That was a, a new era of climbing uh, and it was a step but it was still, it was a, an era in which uh, all but the hardest climbers were going for these high 8,000 meter peaks climbing technically hard routes, using seed-style tactics. Um, and that was in 1970. And then, of course, the next challenge, really, that flowed from that was the challenge of the southwest face of Everest. And you had the Japanese who failed in uh, the spring of 1970. There was a, a big international expedition that failed in 1971. Uh, we went, uh, and there was... Uh, or, and then there's a German expedition in 1972 led by Hurlikofer that failed. We went in the autumn of 1972, the first expedition to attempt it in the post-monsoon season and failed. There's yet another Japanese expedition in the autumn of 1973. And, and finally, in 1975, uh, we managed to climb it. And it, it was the, the biggest challenge, I think, of my climbing career not so much as a climber, but as an, as an organiser, and actually getting the logistics right and realising and understanding that the key problem was not so much how good your climbers are, but whether you can supply those climbers, whether you can keep them going, whether you can keep them fit over a long period of time. And, uh, and I think because we succeeded in doing that, we were successful and we climbed the southwest face of Everest. And the challenge of climbing is actually to, I think, climb it in the most economic way as possible with the smallest possible team. And the, the appealing thing of alpine style climbing is that you pack a rucksack at the bottom of the climb and you keep going till you get to the top. It's total commitment. But it's also very fresh because rather than going up and down and yo-yoing your way up a mountain, 
you're going in a single push. And, um, and this is what you saw happening more and more. So going through from 1975 uh, onto the present day, you saw more and more of the, the best climbers actually using this kind of technique, while at the same time, I mean, siege tactics were used as well. And there's no doubt about it. There are some mountain problems where siege tactics are almost inevitable. I mean, for instance, on the southwest face of Everest, it's only had, um, I think it's four repeat ascents, one of which was an alpine-style ascent by a Czechoslovakian expedition in um, 19... It was in the 1980s, 1987 or 88. And, uh, yes, they did manage to get to the top of the mountain, but they all perished on the way down. In other words, they'd pushed themselves so hard that they weren't able to get back down again. And the problem is, with alpine-style ascents on very, very high mountains, if you spend too much time above 8,000 metres, you become so weak that you can die. And the same, probably, you could say, with the northeast ridge of Everest, which we attempted in um, 1982, just as four of us, Peter Borman, Joe Tasker, Dick Renshaw and myself, using semi-siege tactics. But we were just too small a team. And finally, um, it did succumb. Uh, to a large Japanese expedition, once again using fixed ropes. And probably, uh, maybe someone will climb it alpine style, who can tell? So you've got two types of expedition going on at the same time, the seed style and the alpine style. But I think there's no doubt about it that the alpine style expedition, the small group of, say, four or two people going for it on a mountain, is actually um, both ethically a better way of climbing, and uh, it's certainly uh, environmentally more friendly. And it's, uh, it, it is a great challenge, that's what climbing is all about. So you, you find that each generation is refining the rules, if you like, by which they, they, they go climbing. So I'm now coming back round to climbing with people who are much closer to me in age. And, and we're being modest in, in what we do. We go for, I, I like going for kind of peaks of about 5,000 metres, 5,500 metres that are not technically too difficult. Uh, but it's still unclimbed. You have all the joy of exploration. And, um, and so, you, you one, one, yes, one drops, if you like, one's ambition. Uh, but the joy and the magic of climbing is just as strong. I think, I mean, you never tell what you're going to do, but I think I, I, I will go on kind of trekking and climbing for as long as I possibly can, and uh, as long as I go on enjoying it. And I think I'll go on enjoying it for quite some time. And I suppose my ambition, if you like, is not a, a kind of an ambition to climb any particular thing. My ambition is to be in my 80s and still being able to enjoy going out into the hills and... Uh, and climbing may be terribly modest little things, but I definitely need, I, I like at the end of, if you like, a trek, I need a little hill to get to the top of. So at least at 100 years of age, a 1,000 meter hill? Uh, it, it might be a 20 meter hill by that time. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have author Janki Lennon, who will be sharing from her latest book, Every Creature Has a Story. Hello, I'm Janaki Lennon, here to introduce you to my new book, Every Creature Has a Story. It's a collection of 50 essays about amazing animal behaviors. Since this is the Mussoorie Mountain Festival, I picked a high elevation story for you. Every autumn, bar-headed geese set off from Central Asia, crest the Himalaya, and fly into the Indian subcontinent. When you see these birds, the words that come to mind are plump, heavy, maybe beautiful but not athletic, marathon flyers are world record holders. Typically, the birds take off at dawn, fly all day, and land on the banks of a river or pond where they graze and rest through the evening. And they repeat this routine the next day. But when they reach the great mountains, they fly nonstop for almost 17 hours to cover about 1,500 kilometers. Remember that oxygen is very low at these elevations. To reach such heights, we humans rest for a few days at lower elevations to get our bodies used to the stress of it. 
if we rush through, we suffer from altitude sickness, such as dizziness, vomiting, and headaches. If we ignore these symptoms, fluid fills our lungs and brains, a condition that can lead to death. The geese, however, don't rest in the mountains. Instead, they energetically flap their wings to maintain their course. This aerobic exercise needs 10 to 20 times more oxygen than grazing on the ground. How do they survive this marathon bout of flying? For one thing, they breathe deeply to drive more air into their enormous lungs, and they pant since the air is so thin. Their hemoglobin, the protein in red blood cells that binds oxygen, is more efficient at sticking to oxygen molecules. Their large hearts pump twice the volume of hemoglobin-rich blood to the rest of the body. Many more capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in the body, feed their muscles, delivering oxygen to them. These special features enable the birds to push themselves to the limit without putting their lives on the line. But they aren't the only ones with such high functioning bodies at high altitudes. The people living in the mountains have similar adaptations. They have normal hemoglobin like the rest of us, but they pant much more than plains people. They also have larger lungs just as the birds do. If the journey to India in the autumn is challenging for bar-headed geese, consider their return voyage in spring. They go from sea level to 7,000 meters in one swoop, the steepest climb in any bird migratory path. Next time you see these plump birds waddling along, remember you're looking at one of the finest athletes in the bird world. Every creature has a story, has many more tales like this about a whole range of creatures from plants and insects to elephants and whales. Thank you for reading and watching and coming to this festival. Up next, we have anthropologist, author, and founder of Dinde Dundat, Lokesh Ori. Hi, I'm Lokesh Ori, wanderer in chief at Been There Doing That. And I'm very happy to be a part of the Missouri Mountain Festival. The hill station of Missouri was founded in 1823, and the Queen of Hills will be celebrating its 200th birthday in a couple of years from now. Who discovered this hill station? Who built the first house here? Who saw the potential of this wooded patch? with Mansura bushes growing all over as a space where people could come to rest. I'm here in the Dune Valley, in the foothills of Missouri, and I would like to tell you the story of Frederick Young, who came to India as a 16-year-old cadet from Ireland, to be later described by the Bishop of Calcutta as the king, in fact, of the Dune. Today, Frederick Young is all but forgotten in the valley, his story consigned to but a footnote in history. Behind me, this road, named after him, is perhaps the lone surviving memory of the man who lorded over Dehradun, Masuri, and Landor for over 53 years. In fact, it was the Anglo-Gurkha War that brought Young to the Dune Valley. Young was a de camp or assistant to Major General Sir Robert Rollo Gillespie, a much decorated officer and a colorful character. The battle was fought right here in Nalapani on the Sahasradhara Road and initially proved disastrous for the British. In just the second attack on the fortress of Kalanga, British forces had lost six officers, including their commander Rollo Gillespie who died in Young's arms on 31st October 1814. Eventually, the British won, but so impressed were they with the bravery of the Gurkhas that they erected a memorial for the adversary, a very rare occurrence in military history. While this obelisk in the memorial gives us the names of the British officers killed right in front, the other one for the Gurkha, in a rather embarrassed acknowledgement of the opponents at the back, declares that the Gurkha fought to the last man under their commander, Balbhadra Thapa. Soon, Young would become commander, judge, 
magistrate, collector, surveyor, all rolled into one as the political agent in Dehradun. Despite his several responsibilities, Young was not an aloof officer. He experimented with tea cultivation, studied birds, bred hounds, and walked up the slopes and was the first individual to grow these crops in the Himalayas. By early 1820s, he had built a shooting box on Camel's Back Road and also a sprawling home called Malingar. The house was nicknamed Malingos because Young began to grow the first potatoes in the hills. While combating dacoits on the outskirts of the valley, he also learned to appreciate traits of those whom he had helped vanquish. He petitioned the government that Gurkha soldiers be enlisted in the British Army. The British finally agreed to establish the second Edward VII's own Gurkha rifles, or simply the Sirmur rifles. Young entered my life through my research in the Himalayas. My work has focused on the rituals in the Jansar Bauer region, northwest of the Dune Valley. While I was doing field work here, I came across a few references to Young having visited the shrine of the presiding deity of Jansar, Mahasu Devata. The Mahasu Devata temple is located at Hanol and the deity is treated as a king, the Devata Raja with several people in the region visiting the shrine, seeking justice and answers to life's troubling questions. In the Mahasu temples, it is the Devata's oracles, called Mali, that are possessed, enter a state of trance and pronounce judgments as the divine king's mouthpiece. People willfully accept their decisions as divine will. I tried to fish out details of Young's visits to this temple, but drew a blank. A few months later, I found myself at the British Library, London. I decided to look for the Young Mahasu connection. And there they were before me, Young's journals in his own handwriting, probably being read for the first time after they were penned in 1833. Immediately upon taking over as resident of Dehradun, Young was asked to adjudicate over a dispute on the collection of land revenues between the Raja of Tehri, Sudarshan Shah, and the villagers of Ravain, the region lying between Jonsar and Tehri. After trying to satisfy both parties for over four years, finally Young decided to ride his horse all the way to the Mahasu Devata temple asking both parties to repose faith in divine judgment, if not in the courts of the East India Company. I could only imagine this 33-year-old British officer sitting in the temple courtyard on a sunny June morning, supervising over a consultation with a deity through his medium, with the Raja of Tehri's attorney and the chiefs of Ravine in attendance. As he himself says, in the entire proceedings. The king of the Dune had given way, his own right to be judged to the deity, following the local custom. Today we claim to be modern rationalists. How many of our politicians, scientists and bureaucrats have the ability to comprehend alternative cosmologies? How many of us can tolerate a completely different way of looking at the world as Young did. Next, we have Lalita Krishnan, producer and host of the podcast, Heart of Conservation. Hi, I live in Lando. Someone once asked me, what did you do in your last birth to deserve to live in a place like this? I said it's got nothing to do with karma. I'm just living on credit and need to give back, like most of us do. I'm Lalita Krishnan. I hope this short video will help you become more aware of the biodiversity around your home and perhaps evoke a sense of responsibility for its well-being. Thanks for watching.
For over 10 years, the Hannafil Center has provided a world-class outdoor and environmental education program for groups from across the globe. Half our participants come from India looking for a meaningful experience in a place they already know. And the other half of our participants are coming from overseas and they've never been to India. They're coming for an adventure, they're coming for environmental education, and they're coming for a cross-cultural experience in a new and safe environment. Whether this is your first time in the outdoors or you've got years of experience, whether you have five students or 50, whether you have five days or a semester's worth of time, we can help you design a program to meet your needs. If you've never been to India, we can meet you at the airport New Delhi. If you are from India, we would give you directions to come to Missouri. For both groups, we can hold your hand as much or as little as you would like. We have world-class facilities at uh, Hannibal Center. We have a 32-bed dormitory. We also have two guest rooms for faculty, for instructors. We have the community center, which is a kilometer away from Hannibal Center, which can house another 40 people. The shorter duration courses are housed at Hannibal. The longer duration courses are housed at the community center. We have two classrooms equipped with audio-visual facilities. Besides that, we have a very functional and dedicated library our campus is fully Wi-Fi. We have 24-hour security. We also have a campground, which is called the Put Burgoyne Campground. Apart from the logistical and organizational support that we provide our students and staff, we pride ourselves in the relationships we've created over the years. Whether it be transportation, or porters and guides at the roadheads, or rafting companies, or other vendors that run adventure camps, we feel confident that when our students and staff leave campus for their activity, they will be well taken care of. The Hannibal Center was established 10 years ago with the primary intent of supporting Woodstock School's outdoor education program. Over the years, we've moved on from just taking care of that need to supporting the needs of schools and colleges from India and across the world. From NGOs to university students, from the age of six to the age of 60, from right outside our doors in Missouri to across the world in America, thousands of people have benefited from coming to the Hannibal Center. In addition to the programs we support for schools and colleges from around the world, we have some of our own specialized programs. We run a 16-day trek leader course that's aimed at local youth in this area. We have recently partnered with a company in the United States that will enable us to teach wilderness first aid courses across India. I personally believe that outdoor education brings in the best amongst people. It builds characters of people. Things like conflict management, leadership. Leadership is not only about leading people, but it is also about good followership. It is a great educator. It is a great leveler. We look forward to welcoming you to the Indian Himalaya and helping you run a successful program at the Hannibal Center for Outdoor Education and Environmental Studies. Next, we have writer and photographer Michael Beninov, who will be speaking on the last dog pass of North Sikkim. Hey, everyone out there. Thanks for stopping by for what will be a virtual trip to North Sikkim. I'm Michael Beninov, a writer and photographer based in New Mexico in the U.S., and I've done a number of different projects in the Indian Himalayas. Uh, this is actually my second time presenting at the Musori Mountain Festival, and I'm really happy to be back, uh, even if it's just over YouTube. So I hope you enjoy the slideshow that I have for you now. For the project I'm going to talk about here, I made a couple of trips to Sikkim to spend time with the Dokpas, who are high-altitude yak herders who live in the Himalayas, very near the border between Sikkim and Tibet. By all accounts, including theirs, there is no future for their traditional way of life. The current generation of herders will surely be the last for a number of reasons. But the beginning of the end was really the closing of the border between Tibet and Sikkim in 1962, which they used to migrate across freely. Here's a map that shows where in the world Sikkim is 
in kind of a regional context. And here's a close-up map of the area where the Dokbas live and the now hard border between Indian and Chinese controlled territories. For those stuck on the Sikkim side of the border, the closing of it cut their economic and cultural lifelines. And today there may be just 20 families who still live in the mountains and practice their age old herding lifestyle, while the rest have moved to Tibetan settlements in other parts of the country. Rather than try to give you a complete picture of what the Dokbas refer to as Yak World, I'm going to focus on just one Dokba, who in many ways is the last of the last of his people. Years ago, Dokba families often kept more sheep than yaks, but today there is only one left who herds sheep. His name is Singi. He's the son of Yanzan, who you see here, who was 79 when I met her. His fathers are Seringalpo, who you see here in his sickbed, and Ugin, who are both brothers married to Yanzan. Singhi spends most of the summer 15,500 feet above sea level in a meadow at a place called Falung, which is just beneath the snowy walls of Kachengyao, which scrapes the sky at over 22,600 feet. He keeps his sheep in a shoulder-high pen with rock walls and a handful of rusted, dented gas cans that he stacks together for a gate. Every morning, he takes his flock on a day-long walkabout, returning shortly before dusk. Sheep are difficult to keep, he says. They need to be watched all of the time because of predators like wolves and eagles, whereas yaks can be left to graze unsupervised for weeks at a time. Singhi carries a slingshot over his shoulder so he can hurl rocks at any potential predators, and he also snaps it in the air, empty, when he wants his herd to pick up their pace. Tibetans, Singhi says, believe that sheep were originally created in five colors, just like Tibetan flags. But when the original five sheep were swept away by a river, only two survived. Guru Padmasambhava, the founder of the Nyingma school of Buddhism, gave his blessings to the two sheep so they would provide the basic necessities for Tibetan life. Tibetan sheep, both white and brown, have been especially valued for their wool, which is legendary for its warmth. I mean, just check out the coat on that one. The wool used to be woven into clothing and rugs and was an important trading commodity, as was sheep meat. There are a number of reasons why Dokbas gave up sheep herding. From an illness that hit the herds one year to a shortage of shepherds, as Dokba children were sent out of the mountains to go to Tibetan boarding schools. But what really brought it to an end were regulations on Dokba's selling sheep that were imposed by the Lachenpas, the majority ethnic group who rules the region from their villages lower in the mountains. Keeping sheep suddenly became more trouble than it was worth. So the Dokpas gradually slaughtered their herds and smuggled the meat out of the mountains to sell in Sikkim's capital, Gangtok. Singhi is the last holdout, and he was getting ready to get rid of his too, until the government of India stepped in. Since his is the last herd of Tibetan sheep in all of India, the government was concerned that the country would lose this breed completely, so they pay him a small monthly salary to hang on to his herd. He takes just enough milk from them to make tea, as it's too much work for him to milk them all and he earns some money from the wool he shears each summer. Though Singhi needs meat from his sheep to eat, he refuses to kill them himself. My sheep feel like my relatives. I can't kill them, he says. When one is slaughtered, I chant and make puja, lighting butter lamps and praying for the sheep, for myself, and for the world. Other Dokpa households follow a similar practice, when they slaughter two or three yaks every December, which provides enough meat to last them the entire year. Believing it to be a sin for them to kill yaks themselves, they all hire Nepalis to do it, and they hold ceremonies, praying that the yaks will be reborn in human form in their next lives. Singhi's hut in Falung is made of rocks and earthen blocks. Its scrap tin roof is kept in place with heavy stones. On the inside, 
It's covered by a ceiling of plastic sheeting and supported by wooden rafters black with soot from his cooking fire. The uneven floor is bare dirt. As in the homes of all Dokpas, a small shrine is perched on one wall with butter lamps sitting beneath pictures of the Dalai Lama in various forms of the Buddha. Sitting on a low platform covered with a blanket, Singhi explained that he moves between four houses throughout the year, going up to higher elevations in winter. Because the valleys fill with snow, Dokpas shift in winter to pastures about 18,000 feet above sea level, where the wind is so fierce it blows the snow off the ground, revealing just enough grass for the yaks to survive. They are the rare group of pastoralists who migrate to higher elevations in winter and lower in summer. Singhi says he has no hope of getting married, as, quote, no girl wants to live up here like this. But Singhi is happy with his life. Sheep bring good luck to the world, he says, and they're an important part of nature, so I feel like I'm doing something important by keeping them. Singhi sees the sheep as the connecting link between him and God. That's where I'm going to stop for now. But there is so much more to the story of the Dokpas that I'd really encourage you to go to the website www.lastdokpa.com to see more about it. There's a video there of Singhi shearing sheep and lots more about their culture, the challenges they face, and how they think about the future. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure doing this. Next, we have a performance by singer, music composer, and filmmaker Himanshu Joshi from Kumao Uttarakhand. Hello and welcome to the Masuri Mountain Festival 2020. My name is Himanshu Joshi. I straddle two boats. I am a filmmaker and I am a musician. I sing. Um, my family uh, belongs to the Kumao region of Uttarakhand, specifically Almora. And I grew up listening to a lot of folk songs and melodies of that region, courtesy my uncle, late Sri Mohan Preeti who I consider one of the biggest cultural folk icon to have come out of that region. In his memory, I started uh, a YouTube channel called Kumau Diaries, where I collect um, the songs that he taught me or the melodies that I have heard him humming uh, when I was a small child. Um, and I believe these songs are slowly fading away from the memory of the people of that region. And I want to preserve it for eternity as long as it is there. Um, so I'll be doing a song from that collection which my uncle composed when he was all of 17 years. Uh, he was sitting on the balcony of our ancestral home in Almora, in uh, a place called Rani Dhara. And uh, he saw this dove making a very sad, cooing sound. So he just got inspired and he composed this very beautiful composition where the cooing of a dove reminds the person who is singing the song of someone he or she longs for. Have a listen. <laughs> Guguti Rujo Meri Eju Sudali Rujo Eni Basha Guguti Chardin. 
Next, we have author Virginia Jalis, who will speak on her latest book, Rapture's Roadway. Hello, I'm Virginia. Uh, I'm recording this in Western Australia on the edge of the Southern Ocean, which is quite a different landscape from the High Himalaya, where we're uh, about to go in the company of poet Lawrence Hope. Lawrence Hope's extraordinary life in Imperial India ended with her suicide in 1904, and in the 1980s, my father, in his retirement, became obsessed with her story, an obsession that lasted until, until his death. Here she is. Fantastic photo taken in 1901. In the 1880s, Lawrence Hope married General Malcolm Nicholson of the Baluchi Regiment. It was an unconventional marriage, and one of the um, early rumours um, about their life together was that uh, newly married and unwilling to be separated, Lawrence Hope, who spoke fluent Urdu, disguised herself as a Patan manservant and accompanied the general on campaign in the Zob Valley in Afghanistan in 1890. How likely was this? Um, here's part of a poem that to me suggests a lived rather than an imagined uh, experience. See what you think. It's called Camp Follower's Song, Gomal River, and listen for the marching beat. We have left Gulkach behind us, are marching on Apazai, where pleasure and rest are waiting to welcome us by and by. We're falling back from the Gomal, across the Girdau Plain. The campground is deserted, we'll never come here again. A uh, comparison with the 1908 Imperial Gazetteer of India, with a contemporary satellite image online today, uh, confirms the geography of the poem. And I wonder if Lawrence Hope could have been quite so precise about place and rhythm if she hadn't walked the country herself. Uh, a later poem, Yasin Khan, is set in Khorasan, 
which is on the border of what's now Pakistan and Iran. Um, it's a very intimate description of a manservant's role. Are to exchange this wealth of idle days for one cold, reckless night of Khorasan. To crouch once more before the campfire blaze and watch the starlight glitter on the snows. The plain stretched round us like a waveless sea, waiting until thy weary lids should close to slip my furs and spread them over thee. Um, among Lawrence Hope's Mountain and other poems, the most famous and infamous was Kashmiri Song. It describes a passionate love affair, but it leaves the gender and the race of the lovers uh, intriguingly uncertain. This is the opening verse. Um, it thrilled and scandalized Lawrence Hope's readers um, throughout the empire and beyond. Pale hands I loved beside the Shalimar. Where are you now? Who lies beneath your spell? Whom do you lead on rapture's roadway far before you agonize then in farewell? While it might not exactly be to 21st century taste, it um, appears surprisingly regularly in popular culture. For example, in Kamala Das's autobiography, uh, My Story, she recounts how uh, the poems of Lawrence Hope helped her to seduce a wayward lover. And more recently, if you saw last year's movie Tolkien, about the author of The Lord of the Rings, you will have seen and heard Kashmiri songs sung. Pale hands I loved beside the Shalimar is how it starts, sort of. Higher soprano, usually. Um, there's more, much more to say about uh, Lawrence Hope and my father's obsession with her and my journey throughout India and elsewhere on the track of um, both of their footsteps. Um, it's all in a book published last year called Rapture's Roadway. Here it is. Highly recommended by the author which happens to be me. <laughs> Thank you for your interest and enjoy the festival. Next, we have Rohit Chakravarti, who will speak on his research on bats in the Himalayan region of Uttarakhand. Hello, I'm Rohit Chakravarti. I'm a researcher studying bats in the Himalayas of Uttarakhand. I'd like to begin by thanking the Masuri Mountain Festival. Uh, I cherish every connection to the, the Himalayas and to Masuri. And it's a privilege for me to be able to share stories about Himalayan bats with all of you. Now, Uttarakhand, as many of you might know, is blessed with remarkable biodiversity. There are tigers, leopards, elephants, and of course, the state animal, the musk deer, that are found here. And uh, with such uh, large charismatic animals, the smaller, less charismatic animals often take a backseat in our priorities. But not surprisingly, Uttarakhand also has a remarkable bat diversity. The first and the only surveys here were conducted in the 1870s by the British and they found a rare and enigmatic bat called the Peter's Jubinos bat, uh, which was found in Jharipani in Masuri. And since then, that bat has not been seen again in Uttarakhand. And if you look at the location of Uttarakhand on the world map, it sits at a crucial juncture where animals from Europe, from the Far East and from Peninsular India merged together. So all of these were reasons that brought me, a person from the plains, from dry and hot Nagpur, to start my connection with the mountains. I started my survey of bats in 2016 and 17 in Uttarakhand. My companions throughout the survey were young local boys like Jerry, Pashi, Prabhat and Shamshad who had their own peculiarities and characteristics, but the zeal to work was common among them all. And all these stories that I'm telling you are made possible by their hard work. We started our work in Dehradun, where after a few nights of not catching many bats, we got lucky in Forest Research Institute, where we met Dr. Arun Pratap Singh, who showed us some bats hiding behind a pipe. And guess what? They were European tree-tailed bats that were not known to occur in the Western Himalayan region at that time. After a few such nights uh, of uh, sampling in the foothills, we were ready to move to the hills, uh, where Devalsari uh, turned out to be my most favorite uh, place. It's truly a hidden gem 
in the Aglar Valley uh, beyond Masuri. Um, it's a place that is vastly popular with people who watch butterflies and moths, but the bat potential of that place was not known. It has beautiful Deoda forest surrounded by dry hills, and as a result, there were certain species of bats like the round eared tube nosed bat, uh, which uh, is hairy and looks more like a hedgehog than a bat and the hairy faced bat which is found in dry areas in Southeast Asia and Eastern India. We found it for the first time in, uh, in the Western Himalayan region. But since 2017, most of my work has been based in Kedarnath Wildlife Sanctuary. Kedarnath presents certain advantages over other sites. For one, the forest is more intact. Uh, and most importantly, you can cover a gradient of elevations from 1500 to 4000 meters and see how drastically the bat diversity changes in a mountain range. It is also home to uh, some very fascinating bats, uh, for example, the somber bat, which uh, was until now known from only Darjeeling, where it was caught in the 1970s, and now, 40 years later, we've caught that bat again across the Himalayas in the West. The long-tailed whiskered bat, which is another interesting species, was caught for the first time in India in Kedarnath Wildlife Sanctuary by my team. And then there are species of conservation importance, like the Kashmir cave bat. It's, an, it's, a, it's a bat that is endemic to Western Himalayas depends very heavily on streams and rivers because it feeds on aquatic insects. So that can really be a flagship species for the conservation of stream, streams in Western Himalayas. So after all this stomping around catching bats uh, in Uttarakhand, we found nine species that were found for the first time in the Western Himalayan region. And even more interesting was to record their ultrasonic uh, calls, which can help you tell different species apart and we created a library, a reference library of echolocation calls of bats. So for the last two years in Kedarnath we've been putting out automated recorders that can record bat activity night after night during summers and with this we're gathering data like never before on bats in the Himalayas and in, uh, and at, and in India at large to understand their natural history, their behavior, and most importantly, how would these species get affected by human disturbance and by climate change. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Masuri Mountain Festival 2020. We hope that these presentations have informed and inspired you. This concludes the first session, but please stay tuned. The second session will begin after a short break. Sudah